I watched Avatar 2, and you know what? In the past 10 years I haven't seen anything that would me make jump out of my chair and smash through the screen at full speed with huge hope into the Pandora world with your head. But at the same time, why I'm not able to remember the name of any of the characters? Why I'm so ashamed of all the human beings shown in the film and where does Cameron have such a passion for the dog's ex machine or the god from the machine? In this video I will try to explain why Avatar 2 could not be different even due to the limitless and controversial talent of James. To be honest, when I started to work on the episode, Avatar The Way of Water was something like an optional punchy story advertising itself on the success of the previous film. You know, a typical sequel. But the more I dug into the topic, more I realized that Cameron's money worked for him frighteningly effective. However, the price appeared too high. The sequel filming began from scratch. The crew had needed new cameras that could shoot underwater as well as handle the facial performance capture. This new tech allowed to capture separate frames above and below water. They needed new algorithms, new IE to translate shots into what the audience could see on the screen. All the time. Your body would just explode. So yeah, it's all about a lot no of pressure. pressure. No, a lot of pressure. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's all pressure. Yeah. But uh, but you have to be calm, and I think that it it was for me. It was the toughest thing I've ever had to do. Each time to make a shot, the actors plunge into the huge 30-foot canister. If it seems too easy for you, then you were clearly born a dolphin, cause the dive itself is no longer easy. As soon as your body feels more than normal pressure, a lot of energy begins to be thrown out to bring your body back to the water surface. And you need to go down to the depths of four-story building. And that is my friend just a drop in the ocean. A complex interaction system was developed between visual effects specialists, actors, underwater filming crew and the latest motion capture system, as well as artificial intelligence created specifically for the film. But even worse it. <laughs> Avatar 2 gives this very feeling. Let me explain. As a child, I love to escape from reality. Why should you sit in classroom and listen to the most boring person in the world, usually he's called a teacher, when you can dive into the fantasy world placed right away in your own head? And it's even cooler to see this world on the screen. When I was watching movies as a child, I was experiencing an unusually trembling feeling. When you are so fascinated by what you see, that you want to live this moment again and again mentally floating away in the sea of escapist happiness. As an adult I couldn't feel it anymore and when I began to study cinema I completely forgot about this excitement. But damn it, who would be thought that Cameron is exactly the right person to present me with heavenly deep enjoyment of being blown away with fantasy. I felt inside a child who exulted from infinitely pleasant emotion in the water world of Pandora. However, after some 15 minutes this feeling began to dissipate, hitting the rocks of reality. Is it even the main point of cinematography to maintain emotional connection between you in the dark room and fictional guys on the screen? And then dialogues, it make your hand twitch in attempt to close your ears and unfortunately Simon Franklin's music does not suppress this reflex. Avatar 2 is a mirror copy of the first with minor differences. For the worse. Let me explain. In screenwriting there is a way to move a plot forward in the simplest and most natural way. Suddenly. Suddenly is a classic method that hasn't failed writers for centuries. Suddenly a huge monohorny ball jumped out of Jake Sully. Suddenly Jake Sully is rescued by Neytiri. Suddenly Eva's three seeds choose Jake. In the second film Cameron added the word children to suddenly and we got an exclusively new original story. Suddenly the children went into the forest and ran into the people. Suddenly a shark attacked children. Suddenly the children was captured. Teenagers go explore the world, pull the plot trigger and action scene starts. And so on until the end of the movie. In effect there is nothing wrong with it. 
If the characters were completely and thoughtfully revealed, then it would be easier for me as a viewer to connect emotionally and empathize with heroes. But that didn't happen. There are the five kids in front of us on the screen. Good son, mischievous son, special girl, little girl, human boy. You will not remember their names, you will never know their characters outside of these brief descriptions. Let's take the eldest son. He doesn't have a lot of time in the story, but the plot implies he is going to be a significant character. And he is completely unexplored. There is a huge scene in the film when the main characters are just swimming in the ocean and admiring the underwater views. Yes, this scene that made me fall in love with this movie, but it does not trigger anything to reveal the plot, it doesn't reveal the main characters, it exists only for you to enjoy. Why not to take advantage of this time and show the characters without losing anything in time or resources? For example, let's take a sister of the protagonist. No, a smaller one. She's a little girl who grew up in the woods. Why wouldn't she like to weave flowers into her hair? When the family flies across the ocean, perhaps sister's favorite flower are cut away by the wind. She's constantly crying because of that. Here is the elder brother swimming for the first time in the ocean. He's bad, he does not have a long capacity to swim with everyone. But at the bottom he notices a sea flower very unusual and similar to the one that his sister lost. Overcoming himself, he takes out a flower from the bottom of the ocean and gives it to her. She's delighted, mom is grateful to him, the viewer understands that the boy not just a obedient eldest son, but also a caring older brother who worries about every member of the family, along with his parents. While these events were taking place, we admire the fish, corals and marine life in the same way as shown in the film. Ok, you are asking who am I to develop a character better than Jim? But the bottom line is that he himself perfectly used this absolutely elementary technique in the first part. He managed to reveal the main character simply through the interaction with the environment. For example, where Jake is childish manners is playing with plants when animals suddenly attack him. A few scenes later he meets Neytiri who calls him a mindless child and he follows her around playing with fluorescent flower. And what about this scene, where Jack has to jump after Neytiri into complete obscurity? What does this scene tell us? He's brave, vigorous and trusts Neytiri with his life, and any viewer gets it without a single word. It's just that the characters interact with setting and makes decisions. But there is more to come. Why are four screenwriters of the film that take 30 years to develop and able to think a more interesting plot twist than a graphic kids and tie them with handcuffs? Ok, this is cliche that has been proven over the years, but why to repeat it three times per third act? The complication of the film boiled down to the same event. I watched this film in a hall filled with spectators. And you know what? The most vivid emotion – laughter. I heard at the very moment when Jake's daughter Sally was handcuffed for the third time in a row. Cameron's appeals to the one of the most effective weaknesses – fear for the loved one. And unfortunately, the plot development construct to give only this particular feeling each time. Each Cameron story is laced with themes that personally torment him. The uncontrolled development of technology insatiable corporation, neo-colonialism, extensive militarization, xenophobia, social inequality and even true feminism. Over the past 10 years James has devoted himself to a lot of very valuable scientific research. But why is he ready to give the remaining years of his life to the production of Avatar? Eventually I realized, okay, I can just be another drive-by do-gooder or I can go make more Avatar movies and reach a much wider audience. He believes that the meanings he puts into the film will be able to resonate in the hearts of a huge number of people. Possibility of the Avatar universe reaching a lot of people with a persistent kind of emotional message and, and, and reaction on the part of the audience to maybe fight for and protect. And this business really deserves many years of hard work. Avatar's accessibility is the sacrifice that Jim 
pace by eschewing more complex dramatic construction, creative plot reveals and the sudden twists, which are replaced here by overused God in the machine. By the way, if you forgot what a plot twist, I recommend you to take a look at my video about work of George Martin, where I tell you how this technique works. Now back to Avatar. I'm so excited for our audiences to see because so many people, no matter how old you are, can connect to this film. Cameron literally opposes his films to the Marvel franchises, achieving stunning results while not presiding on other people's concepts, hiring hundreds of specialists to achieve perfect compatibility with every audience on the planet, which in the release dozens of absolutely identical films changing palettes on the covers. Many of the stories told by Cameron are already a cultural phenomenon, disputed into quotes and memes, discussed and remembered by generation of viewers. At the same time, he still remains at the top and continues to invest huge budgets into the development of the industry and visual effects like no other. The new film is confirmation that Cameron is still able to create outstanding films in modern history that deserve attention and love.